So let's, let's move on and take a look at, at random forests, this 4.2. This is another method, like as I said, that's, that's um, incredibly useful and um, has been applied in astronomy a lot. You can look up random forests on AD, ADS and you'll find a lot of different things. So random forests are another, another method that is really nice and intuitive. So a random forest starts out with the notion of a decision tree. And this is like, uh, if you ever played that game, 20 questions, you know, decision tree is just a 20 questions game. So let's say we're, we're looking at an animal and we want to classify what that animal is. So you might, you know, internally in your mind, you might, if you're trying to do this, you might think to yourself, well, how big is that animal? If it's greater than one meter or less than one meter, right? And then you say, well, if it's greater than me one meter, does the animal have horns? And you say, yes or no. And if it's yes, you ask, are the horns longer than 10 centimeters, right? And all of a sudden, with three questions, we know that this is a large animal that has horns longer than 10 centimeters. And I bet you could guess that's one of you know, four or five animals that are out there. So this, this binary decision process can be really, really powerful. We've gone, in three questions, we've gone from the space of all living creatures to something that's basically a sheep, or maybe something related to that. And the other thing, like, you know, we say the animal is less than one meter. Does it have two legs? Yes, it has two legs. Does it have wings? You know, yes, it has wings. And you go, ah, it's, you know, it's a bird. We've, we've asked three questions, and we already know that it's basically a bird, right? So these binary decision tree things are, are really, really powerful. They can be really powerful if you ask the right questions, right? And have any of you guys seen this little, this, this cool little game? It's like an egg-shaped thing that, um, it, you think of something and then it asks you a series of questions and after like eight questions it, it reads your mind, right? All it's doing is a binary decision tree, and right? And if you do if you do two to the eight, you you can all of a sudden split things into, into a lot of categories and get some really good answers. Especially if you tune the answers based or the questions based on the answers. So what it, what a decision tree does then is it takes our data and applies this sort of binary splitting process. But um, a decision tree in machine learning, the, the trick is asking the right questions. Right? If, we, if we constructed this tree and we asked silly questions like, is our animal greater than 1,000 meters? No. Okay, is our animal greater than 900 meters? No. Okay, is it greater than 800 meters? No. Right? We could ask a lot of questions and we could, wouldn't gain any insight. But if we ask the right questions, we get a lot of insight. And a decision tree acts along this same sort of thing. So in, in scikit-learn, there's this um, function. OK, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to create some data. This, these will represent our animals, right? These are four different labels, and we have some information about, about each of the types. And we're going to try to create a decision tree that at each level says, basically, is y greater than greater than 5 or less than 5, and then it'll classify things based on that. And the second level, second question I'll say maybe is x greater than 0 or less than 0. And you can see that by subdividing the space this way, we might be able to, to gain some infor information. So here's our, our IPython interactive again. And this is what the, the decision tree looks like. Um, if you look at this code, I'm, I'm actually going in here and creating a decision tree for each step with scikit-learn. So this is actually what's going on. So we feed scikit-learn this data, and, the, and it looks at it and says, well, the, the most information I can get, this is a bit hard to see in here, isn't it? Can you guys see that all right with the colors? Yeah. Looks way better on my screen. So scikit-learn goes in and says, I need to ask some sort of question and split you know, this into two. It says the, the most information I can get with a single question at this point is to draw a line there and put all the red points above and everything else below. And then you go one step down and it says, well, within that top node and within that bottom node, what's the question that I can ask? Um, and in the top node, it's, it's all red already. So it basically says, I've found the answer there for this top one. So now in the bottom one, let's find a split function that that optimally you know, splits apart the, the various information. And it finds a split function that you know, splits along the x, and it says you know, the ones to the left are yellow, the ones to the right are some combination of blue and turquoise. And you can see what happens here is we 
we go we go another level deeper, and it, it'll ask a question about this region and about this region, and splits those apart. And now it says that you know, within this left region, I'm going to ask about is y greater than or equal to this value. Within the right region, I'm going to ask is y greater than or greater than or less than this value. And so each step, you kind of like you kind of zero in on the differences in the training set and. You can, based on this training set, you can design a set of questions that's optimal to go down and, and classify what's inside of those. And as you go deeper and deeper, you can see that you know, it splits every time, and um, we, we can go even farther than that if we wanted to, but it starts to get a little bit crazy and ridiculous after a while. So, so the, these are sets of optimal questions for a single decision tree on this data, and now once you've, once you've constructed this tree, it's the classification task, right? You put a new point on there, you draw an X right here, and you know that the label is turquoise. You draw an X right here, you know the label is yellow, and you know, purple, red. Um, so it's a nice process, and, and this is what we're going, we're going five levels deep here. So for each point, it just has to ask five binary questions about it, and it gets a nice classification. <coughs> Um, but do you see a problem with that? Like, what, what if you got to the point where your decision tree was so fine that you, you were able to pull out these points and you were able to pull out you know, these yellow and blue points? What would be the problem then? Uh, classify the new point. Yeah, classify a new point. You're, you, you plot the new point on there and you're not really getting the right answer. You're, you're sort of, you're basically fitting the noise. This is, decision trees, it's really, really easy to overfit your data. So, Right now we see this already. Um, like this right here, it's hard to see, but this long, thin thing is a purple region. So based on our decision tree, we've decided that if a point is right there, we're going to label it purple. Right? And that's, obviously, looking at this, that's a little bit ridiculous, right? You, you wouldn't label that a purple point. But based on, our, based on our classification, that's what's going on. So decision trees, it's really, really easy to overfit the data to kind of be more sensitive to noise than to signal. And um, one way to get around this, and this is where, where the subject of this comes in, um, one way to get around this is to use something called random forests. So individual trees are, are overfitting the data. But if you look at collections of trees, if you, if you have 100 trees all together that are somewhat randomized, it turns out that uh, that overfitting can be stopped, which to me is just a, a little bit magic, but, but it works, right? So let's, um, yeah, so here, here is, for example, are two decision tree classifiers. I've removed the lines so you can just see what's going on here. We have, let's actually make the depth um, Let's make the depth even deeper. Let's do a max depth of 10. So now you can see for these classifiers that they're, um, this is the same, same data, except we're taking here, we're taking the first 200 points, and here we're taking the last 200 points. And these, both these decision trees overfit the data, right? We, we still have these weird things like saying, you know, this would be labeled purple out here because, just because of the way this happens to split up. And over here, you know, this one would be labeled purple. But what you notice is that with, with one subsample of the data, the overfitting is different than with the other subsample of the data. Right? So over here, we didn't get the weird purple thing, whereas over here, we did. So it's something about the noise of the particular data set that we're looking at that causes these, these weird overfitting spikes. Um, so the, the idea behind decision trees is that if you have these these two different views, or sorry, the, the idea behind random forests is that if you have these two different views of what's going on that have different levels of overfitting, then looking at a lot of these will, will make these, these sort of things average away. You know, like this, this will only pop up maybe one in a hundred times. So if we average this with a hundred different random trees, then on average this will be yellow. And you know, on average right here, this, this will be yellow or blue. And so by looking at, at multiple trees, we can kind of get around that, um, that fitting the noise problem. Um, so just to make, make this a little easier to see, I have this, this uh, um, 
this interactive thing. So we're, we're just changing, here we're changing the random seed and we're fitting 90% of the points each time. But we're making a, a really overfitting tree. So you can see each of, these, each of these individual trees is overfitting the data. But you start to see patterns, right? The up here is almost always red. So if you average all these out, this, um, this region up here in the upper left would be red every time. And similarly, this region down here in the lower right would be blue every time. There's a little bit of, you know, a little bit of noise depending on the particular no, uh, draw of the data. But if you average over all of them, then this will be blue. And this down here will be yellow every time. And then you'll have some piece in here that will be purple every time. So see how we did this? We have, we have 100 different decision trees, and each one of them is randomized somehow by taking a different draw of the data. So we could imagine doing this by hand and actually taking all these decision trees and, and you know, averaging the outputs. But we don't need to do that because scikit-learn has that built in there. And what's called is a random forest classifier. So instead of using the, um, the decision tree, we, from Ensemble we import random forest classifier. And here we can tell it that we want 100 estimators. And then we can visualize the results and we get something like this. So by, by We've still gone to, I think, let me, let me just explicitly say the max depth here is 10. We'll do the max depth of 10. And so we've done 100 trees, each of which is asking 10 questions and doing, you know, overfitting our data, dividing it into these really fine things. When you average out the results, you get these nice, nice, uh, nice boundaries. And you can see that. Um, our data sets do have some overlap in the middle. There, there are some points that it's kind of impossible to, to perfectly tell apart. But our random forest does a good job of choosing those, choosing those boundaries in a non-parametric way. Right? There's, no, there's no function that will tell you those boundaries. But um, it, it gives us something that we can trust. So uh, random forests and, and, in general, ensemble methods, which is what they call are basically a way of averaging a whole bunch of estimators in order to prevent this overfitting problem. And one of the reasons random forests are really popular is because decision trees are, are really, really fast, right? All we have to do for each decision tree at every point, we just have to ask maybe 10 binary questions about it, 10 yes or no questions. And once that's trained, we can do that incredibly fast. 